Awesome. Okay, so we are live on Facebook. Good afternoon. Hello, Facebook land. <laughs> this is Wellness Wednesday. I'm Beth Copeland with Georgia Christian Business Network, and we're putting God back in business. And I'm excited about that today. I just, you know, listen, I got to tell y'all something. Rich prayed right before we came in and we were chatting about some things and I felt just like a total release. And I have to share that with you. Prayer does work and it doesn't take God long as long as we surrender to him. So it's Wellness Wednesday at Georgia Christian Business Network. And one of my favorite opportunities to join the platform with two of my favorite people, Richard Oswald and Pamela Bartell. Listen, they are Georgia Christian Business Network corporate sponsors. Yay, I love that. You know, they, they're just like, oh, we just serve, you know. Mm -hmm. But not only do they serve by undergirding GCBN, as we affectionately say, with undergirding us financially, but as evidence here, week after week, Wednesday at noon, they are faithful and committed to assist us in helping you become mentally well. And they help me too. Don't tell them, but I'm just learning. <laughs> I clean as probably as much as you do. But an opportunity for them this morning is to introduce to you directly from their voice so that you can hear who they are, what they do, and why you should care. We've been promoting them, but this is an opportunity for them to tell you what they do. Who's first today? Thank you so much. And, uh, and also... Uh can't bust the tradition ahead. right now. Goodness gracious, that'd be just upsetting the entire audience and throwing us all into a just state of massive confusion. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like Beth said, my name's Rich. Uh, I have a counseling practice in a little town of Snellville, east side of Atlanta, uh, not too far from Stone Mountain Fun Attraction. It's the largest deposit of granite mountain in I don't know if it's the southeast, at least in Georgia. But anyway, for whatever that's worth, go check it out. <laughs> they charge you money to get into the park. So they sure do. <laughs> they, they, they do. It's not a state-run thing. Anyway, <laughs> but I have a counseling practice, uh, and we uh, work with individuals, couples, and families. Uh, Pamela and I do a lot of the similar things, uh, working with people with trauma, and helping them sort through things that are keeping them trapped and having flashbacks and preventing them from doing the things they really want to do, helping relationships and couples, families to better communicate, better connect, to resolve some personal conflicts and interpersonal conflicts and even intrapersonal stuff that's inside of you that's causing issues and well as just maybe some life transitions, some questions, some processing things you need to discuss whether it's family or work or working for family or working with family or all goes of fun stuff is that. And uh, I work from with adolescents on up. I know Pamela is a little younger and she's got some other stuff, but she's been in practice since our bicentennial of our country. So that's how I remember it. I haven't been there that long. I was four at the time. So you can do the math. That was, uh, she was helping me when I was four. <laughs> But like Beth, I get I get a lot of help with this too. Uh, my sisters in Christ are uh, quite amazing women and uh, glean a lot of encouragement and, and support and insight from them as well. So thank you. There's my long monologue of semi-introduction with humor. I get a lot of help as well. And uh, in fact, I, as Rich said, I do kinds of things that he does in my practice, a healing journey, counseling and consultation, which is in Northwest Georgia in a little town called Cartersville, uh, Georgia. Uh, as Rich pointed out, I have been providing compassion care since 1976. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, uh, certified master addictions counselor, and an ordained minister. Uh, I'm also a United States Air Force veteran. And we just celebrated, by the way, uh, Vietnam Air Vets. So I want to say to all the Vietnam Air Vets, congratulations. We're very grateful for the sacrifices. That Thank you. Made, you. Uh, yes. That time. So today we are going to uh, con conclude our discussion about grief. And one of the things that uh, Jenny, who's out here, Jenny Smith, who's out here with us today, 
she reminded us that grief is just unresolved conversations. The conversations that we didn't have an opportunity uh, to have. And the other thing that I always like to remind people is that uh, grief is an indication of the depth of the love that you had for an individual that you lost or even for an activity that you were, in which you were uh, engaged. Uh, grief is very healthy. One of the questions we addressed last, or week before last is whether or not Christians should grieve. And I reminded, I was just thinking uh, as we were talking before uh, we came online, that as we are uh, coming up to Resurrection Sunday, uh, we, you know, the disciples had started to grieve because they knew that Jesus was leaving, but here's what Jesus said to them. And it's uh, Christians often say, Christians do not grieve, misquoting the scripture in Thessalonians, but uh, that scripture says, uh, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And that's exactly what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, look, you're gonna mourn right now because I'm leaving you. He said, but remember, I'm coming back. <laughs> and so yeah, you're mourning, but you're mourning with the hope that you're going to see me again. Yeah. Uh, we dispel some myths um, last week about how long grief should last and uh, again, whether or not Christians should grieve. What were some of the other myths we dispelled, Beth? The, the myths, I know all six of them. Don't feel bad. Replace the loss. And I don't know these. I'm reading these, by the way. I just want you to know. <laughs> because Jenny actually thanked us and just listed all of those. And I've, I've been looking at that post this week. And so don't feel bad. Replace the loss. Grieve alone. Be strong or be strong for others. That's where I was held hostage. Uh, keep busy and time heals. You know. uh, and remember, yeah. those are myths. And what's a myth? A myth is an untruth that has been accepted as something that we should do. Now, it's untrue. So don't grieve alone. Grieve uh, with nurture a, a, a around you. Um, mm -hmm. I, one of the things I often say to people, we learn how to misbehave or to behave in an unhealthy way. In group or in relationship, we also need to learn to heal in relationship. And so in one relationship. Right. One of the things that I wanted to mention when I listed those six is the three that we addressed last week was grieve alone, time heals, and be strong are strong for others. Um, the three that we didn't really highlight a lot is don't feel bad, replace the loss and keep busy, you know. So those are some opportunities for us to discuss today as well, you know. And we know that keeping, all keeping busy does is brush things to, to, to the side. The imagery, and, and Rich, you may have used it with some of your clients. The imagery I use is it's like uh, uh, sweeping garbage under the rug. And what happens is, yeah, it's covered up. You don't see it. But my goodness, you can stumble over it. Mm -hmm. And so you push that down. You, and you say, oh, this is gone. And, and you're not dealing with it. And yet, uh, quoted my mom last week too, that if it didn't come out right, it's going to come out sideways. It's going to come out. And it's going to come out in a destructive way. And so it's so very important to deal with it. We're going to save that. You, you looked well, as though well, you had, had something on your face. Well, yeah, I was just what you were saying. Like your mom said, my mom uh, used to say is that we had a habit of sweeping things under the carpet, under the rug. And, and what I learned is over the years from her is if you continue to sweep things under the rug, uh, concealing to cover up, eventually you're going to forget what you, you're going to stumble over it one day because you right. won't be able to walk on the rug. You'll actually stumble over it. If you continue to sweep things under that rug, sweep it under the rug, sweep it under the rug. Basically I'm covering it. I'm hiding it. I'm pretending from, it. it's not. Yeah. From a mental health perspective too. And Richard, if you'll speak to this, if you think about it, 
let's say you, you're sweeping something under the rug. Let's say it's uh, uh, some moldy food or something. What happens is it deteriorates and then it begins to rot that which is underneath it as well. So you are not only causing what you are concealing to be toxic, you're causing what is around it to be toxic. Can you talk about that, Rich? For sure. Uh, yeah, to, one of the things you can think about is you bury whatever it is, hurt and fear or pain or loss underneath the carpet or under in your heart and try to not pay attention to it. I mean, we, my wife and I rightly say something a little bit more macabre, but it's, if you bury something alive, it's still alive and it, and it cries out, it's malnourished. It's, it's uh, not attended to, and we live out of that, whether we believe it or not, it has an effect on us and it affects how we relate to other people. It affects how we see ourselves, it affects the choices we make, affects the attitude we have. Uh, it can affect the behavior we do. So that has ramifications further along in things. And we have to deal with things or ignore things that now are negative uh, consequences or responses to something we've done that was out of uh, missing something or ignoring something. So it, it spirals out all over the place. And it's, I know the illustration he uses dominoes. If you stood dominoes up, you know, there's lots of, um, records out there for the longest domino train but I, you see those ones that are like the triangle formation and the one hits the two and hits the four or three and so on that's kind of like a, how i see our behavior or that one that hits the two around us and maybe it's a lot more but then that ripples out to affecting other people and now we have a lot more and right there, i was thinking about how our unresolved grief can actually uh uh trigger grief in others. I was talking to someone just the other day who uh, decided not to go to a memorial service because this person believed they were somehow not worthy to mourn that person because they thought they had contributed to that person's death. Oh, wow. What that does is now the other people who were in a relationship with them Mm -hmm. Because they didn't want to go around those people because they didn't know how those people were going to view them. Now those other people have lost them. So mm -hmm. while they, they're grieving the death of someone, now they're grieving the loss of a relationship. So your inability or unwillingness to resolve your grief actually provoke grief in other people. Mm -hmm. Th yeah. That is so good. I actually experienced that at my mom's um, when, at, at, at during that period of time, during that season when she had transitioned and um, someone that I expected would be there to support me, you know, a friend, she got some things twisted and she just wasn't there. She just checked out. And it was like the impact of that, you know, like with my mom, my dad, I was always, although I wasn't over her uh, uh, estate, I was over my dad's, but I still was looked to as a leader to help guide the person that was handling that. And so I was, I, I mean, I was checking off, uh, be strong or be strong for the others. I was checking off, um, replaced a loss and in, in, in unfortunately grieve alone, even though I had Jerome and, you know, my children and my uh, spiritual daughters and everybody were close to me and a few of my family members. Um, but at the same time, when your expectations are unfortunately in people and they don't deliver, you know, you start to grieve that, you know, and I didn't even realize are associated with grief at the time, but that is so good that you're and saying using that. Jenny's definition of those um, unresolved or those conversation. unresolved conversations. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I didn't even have that, a conversation. That lack of connection. Like, yeah, yeah. Mm. 
But then I realized something, and I don't know if you guys can deal with this or throw it out the window or something, but she had lost her mom within six months to a year prior to my mom. And see, from my perspective, I was just all in and all over that, you know, for support and everything. And you can't compare what I did for her and what she didn't do for me. But at the same time, what I'm trying to say from her perspective, although she was claiming this and this and this, that she felt like she wasn't needed or wanted or whatever, mm. it could have been unresolved grief that she was dealing with from her mom. Mm. You know, and that goes I back later. to one of the things we said in the uh, first uh, session that we did on this, and that is everyone grieves in their own way. We, we all grieve differently. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And we didn't, we uh, kind of bent it around and said it's not a process with, ind with indicate steps mm -hmm. along the way. And, and when we think about it that way, we think about uh, what stage am I in, what step in the process am I in? And that's not a good way to look at this because it assumes everybody does it the same way. Everybody spends however much time in the same step and they expect the next one to be just like the book tells you, you go research in it and there's five and seven and 15 and a whole bunch of other ones, different perspectives and number of steps. And, you know, Pamela, you pointed out it was studying uh, what those who were going to Google die. Ross is the one who developed it was yeah. studying the dying person. Those steps were designed yeah. around the dying person, not right. the living person. Right. And, and yeah. not even expanded to grieving loss of a job or a loss of, depending on different relationships, spouse, parent, child, right, sibling, friend. So I think they all have different flavors to them. And that's it. We said it's an experience and giving us the, freedom to go with whatever type of feelings or thoughts we have whenever we have them. And we may revisit the same type of part of the experience repeatedly. And you think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm angry now. I'm not going to be angry again. Well, you may be, maybe about something different, a different aspect of it. And that's one thing I talk to people about is that proverbial peeling of the onion it feels the same, looks the same, but it's not the same size. It's at a different level. And a lot of times we're talking about God doesn't give us more than we can handle and find a path out. And I think when we, if he gave us the whole onion to deal with at one time, it would be overwhelming that the experience he walks us through is you know, bits and pieces as we go along. And if we look back over our experience with grief, whatever circumstance it is, and I'll ask people, okay, what we're addressing now, would you be able to have addressed that however long, mm -hmm. six months ago? And every time the answer is no, it would, that would not have been something they could have handled. And this, you see through the, the steps you've taken, the process you've gone through or experience you've gone through, you have healed because it's determined. It's like you can run a mile now when, uh, uh, you know, six months ago. Before you, you could. You could, want to, yeah. you could run a block, and, and that was and it. Speaking of God, uh, people are uh, become alarmed that they may feel anger toward God. Well, you know what? Peter was angry with Jesus when Jesus said he was going to the cross. Yeah. Yep. yeah. It happens. Yeah. It happens. It's almost a, to expect it in lots of ways. As there are things that don't come out uh, in our perspective and our pain and our confusion and our struggles sometimes until a circumstance brings them out and you might be denying your you have a certain view of god um, that would promote feeling anger until but then when something happens that kind of pokes right at that um, question of confusion it promotes the anger and you you can't not feel to me emotions are all good I think we talked about that months ago. And they're just they're appropriate all, or inappropriate. Yeah. And, ah. and they're telling us what's going on inside. Right? I may be angry at God. Well, okay. Is that appropriate and inappropriate? Well, it's appropriate for where you for are. For that moment. For that moment. It, it is it accurate. Like, should, 
that did, did God do something wrong that you should be angry at him? Well, no. It's not here. And even we get angry at things that are not necessarily wrong, but things that right. are inconvenient at the time. And True. what I uh, point out there is, you know what that says that you're angry at God? Did you have a relationship with him? <laughs> you, you know, I'm Mickey, so glad you said yes, it. love it. I'm so glad you said that, Pamela, because this is it. Um, God is, you know, listen, he's God, he's sovereign. He already omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He knows what we're feeling and what we're thinking. Uh, for someone to question my relationship with my husband, you know, and whether or not I should get upset with him. And I'm going somewhere with this because we're, we're, we're one, we're intimate. I have an intimate relationship with God. You know, how can you tell me that I'm wrong from expressing because God said to me to come boldly to the throne of grace. And if that's true, then it's just not boldly. Most times that's quoted as an opportunity for me to ask him for something uh, boldly and be courageous like that, mm -hmm. but also to be expressive of God, this is how I'm Love feeling because he already knows how I'm feeling. And so God, this is where I am. And, and although I know the truth of who you are, my feelings, you know, he said to be angry, but to sin not. And sometimes I've heard people say that they were angry at God at times in a lot. Sometimes people act irrationally out of their anger, right? And, you know, the thing that we have to learn is, and, and this is just coming up right now, is God has, has a plan and we are part of it. You know, recent opportunities of where pe we saw people act irrational out of their anger, because I don't, no, and you know, you guys are the counselors. I just know what I know through wisdom from God. I'm resolved things in our life. And when something comes up that looks like that thing that was unresolved, and I'm saying this time I'm going to win. When God had a plan for you to win, and you would have come out a little bit better down the road, you know, you could have actually stated your truth at a time when God was glorifying you and honoring you. But the thing that sometimes we, we fail to do is to be truthful with God and say, you know that matter back there, although I'm right here, but that one back there, I still have not resolved that. And, and I'm wondering why you allowed that to happen. And then things that we do to bring on things into our lives, we question, God, why didn't you hold, why didn't you, why did you let me do that? Or why did you, you know, or, or why didn't you hear where I was coming from with that, you know, or something like that? And we're not truthful in expressing how we feel. Most times, I'm going to tell you, though, I have to say this and I'll pass the mic, so to speak, is most time, what most often what I learn is that he was there, he was trying to, but I acted out of my own feelings. Okay, look at Pamela. Okay, so I'll let you take it from there then, oh, okay? I, I, I'm going back and this will feel as though it's not even connected, but I'm going back. The language arts teacher in me says, that sentence says, be angry and sin be not. Angry. It's a whole sentence. It's a whole sentence. Be angry, sin not. Remember from your That'll do it. Class, That'll do it. As there's a be angry, there, semicolon, and then there's sin. And not. Yeah. So they are two subjects. They are two complete subject matters. Oh, is that, is that a command too to say be uh, be angry? I would or, say to it's, embrace it's, your emotion your that you're feeling. Yeah, it, it's like the rug to me. It's it's the rug. One day you're going to stumble. And the higher you allow that rug, it's going to be the higher you fall. You know? So, so what do you think? Ahead, you tell me. Go ahead and do this. Because you know what? I don't know that you could even sin not without actually leaning into what it is that you were experiencing. Mm -hmm. So by try not to hear, being try to hear angry. What I'm saying. Yeah. By not knowing and being truthful to use Beth's word, not being authentic 
You're lying. But you are experiencing. <laughs> I don't even know that you can sin not without actually being angry. Just, just saying. How know, about I, that for uh for some deep? Any uh, theologian out there can challenge me. I'm just saying from my language arts counselor perspective. But that's what that we use. Says. But that's, that's what we good. use to, to to explore the what the scripture is saying too. You get language arts and then the different types of literature that are in the scripture and not take everything as a command. Sometimes it is. And what is it? Oh, I can't remember what somebody said. It's, it's, it's not a directive. Uh, it's an example kind of thing. And uh, uh, suggested. yeah. And I can't remember how she said it, it was a really good way of like, it's, it's not a directive or pre it's prescriptive, but not, or it's descriptive, but not prescriptive. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. So it's ah. just because it may describe something doesn't mean we have to do that. Right. Um, and sometimes but it gives you that. permission to express your right. emotion and yeah. it tells you how you can do that. In a healthy, I don't know that we can be human way. and I, I don't know that we can be human and not at some point in our lives. You know, I'm here with the baby this week, experience anger. I'm talking about a two year old. If, if she's not, she can be angry about something, I can see. But what we have to teach her is the rest of where that conjunction is. We have to, the second part of that is, but sin not. Right. Okay. It's okay to allow her to express her displeasure about whatever it is that she's the predicament that she's in at the moment. And what has happened is too long is over the, what we see today when they grow up, if no one's, you know, channeled that and said, sin not. You know, but you, can just, you just go out there and shoot somebody because you're angry or slap them across the face or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. you do what you want to do to express your anger. No, what he's saying is, yes, be angry. So to Rich's point, I hear all of that, that the expression of that anger, um, you're saying, well, you're talking about grief recovery. If I'm going to recover, I got to express my anger. But that's why you need counselors. Express and the grief emotions. Coaches. Yes, those are and, emotions. And back to grief and back to the, the things that the scripture point to concerning grief. I'm going back to Old Testament in Ecclesiastes 3 where it says there's a time for everything. And one of the things that it says it's a time for is a time to grieve. You know, so there's a time for everything. And, and so from Old Covenant to New Covenant, we are given permission and as Rich said uh, a couple of weeks ago, we are indeed all, uh, almost um, uh, admonished mm -hmm. to grieve because without doing so, we cannot live healthily, you know, in our relationships mm -hmm. because there's always that crap cloud, rather, or there's always that wall of, you know. Yeah, it's not freedom. You're still imprisoned in whatever it is that's keeping you trapped, right? And wow. Yeah. So one of the things I want to jump in here and and think as far as over the last weeks, uh, people may be asking. So in my experience of grieving, there's these different things that three or four of us have talked about. But what are some tools, practical? Uh, behaviors they can do to walk through the different aspects of of grief so I don't know what suggestions you two may have for that one of the things i do when you're talking about an individual who has died uh is uh i always suggest that people celebrate the life celebrate the relationship uh uh, uh even when there is this maybe a tragedy that has led to the death, if you're able to go back and celebrate who that person was, how they showed up in the world, and celebrate their relationship with you, then it's as you've got the presence of those memories as to nurture you through. The rest, I, I, I think about even now, uh, today I was uh, in a session and, 
you know, I, I didn't disclose it to the client, but it helped me with what I did finally say to the client was I remembered uh, my papa. Mm. Uh, papa was a person who, uh, uh, if anyone taught me integrity, I, I, my parents did yes, but, but the person who really, really uh, instilled integrity in me was my papa. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I am at a place where I'm having ethical dilemmas or whatever, I remember Papa. I celebrate the man of integrity that my Papa was. And that's one of the ways that I am able to healthily grieve my Papa. Now, not mind you, he died in 1964. Mm -hmm. So am I, quote, over it? I'm not over it in terms of I don't remember my relationship with my papa, but instead of remembering back with sadness and heaviness, because I celebrate who he was in the world and who he is or was to me, when I think back, I can remember. So how would somebody see Pamela celebrating her papa? Even now, some, some people would really. think that perhaps I've just forgotten that I didn't really grieve him. But other people would, and, and it's helped a lot of my clients, have been able to say, yeah, you know, when I think about how that person showed up in the world, that gives me hope. That, that is so good because I've watch my sister for the last 20 years this would have been 21 but she didn't do it this year but for 20 years prior she actually celebrated my father my late father our late father and with a memorial service every year and she was relentless to get him to recognize be recognized in Lawrenceville with the on the medallion trail that they created and he was the first black man of um, they had assigned about 20 at that time. Now, since thereafter, there are others that actually were uh, honored as a medallion in Lawrenceville through the Heritage Trail, um, the city of Lawrenceville. But I'm saying that it just brings you joy. You know, it brings you joy. We've done things to salute our mom and other people. I've noticed that is a freedom that comes from that and saying, because honestly, we have a tendency sometimes, and I know that we, the sadness associated with it, and I'm probably talking from Beth Copeland, you know, when I think of my mom, initially, I go to the sadness of her not being present uh, with me, rather than what you guys are saying and proposing, and as I was reflecting and listening, it is so true. If you focus on some of those things, yes, I'm sad that she's not here. You know, at uh, the birth of uh, my, our last grandbaby, Alessia, and I'm in our home, so I'm thinking of her a lot today, but this is so good. You know, my first thing is like, mom would have loved, you know, I'm in a joyful time in my life. And then I think of mom would have loved to have met Alessia, oh my God, she would have doted on that. But now what I get to do, and I was even thinking about this this morning, is I get to share with Alessia some of the things that mom taught me. And I know Romy and I were talking about some things, but some things to me are important. You know, like my mom taught us the manners, which I sent down to the same type of manner. Some of them are outdated to some people. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, thank you, and please. But those are important to me. And that's what she'll say to me, you know, because I got that heritage. And every time I'm doing it, I'm reminding myself of the joy of what my mom taught me what I taught my kids and passed it down. So that's her part of her heritage because those things were important to her. I adopted them. I embraced them. They became important to me. And now I pass it down the line because I made it important to them. And it, you know, and it, it's like fourth generation. Now, mm -hmm. is she here? Is she here to it? It, it, but you can experience her presence. The scripture that just came to my mind. Excellent. Was, Weeping endures for the moment. 
joy comes in the morning. Yes. And the morning that arising every morning and being able to celebrate. Yes. Yes. How your loved one showed up in the world and what their relationship to you was brings that joy that you know, even though the weeping, the mourning endured, joy counts. Joy comes. Yeah. So you you made an intentional, whether it's mental or, or write it down or both, of what are the positives that your mom contributed? What are the things that you celebrate? Because if you were just stuck in, you know, every time you thought of her, you thought about how she's not here. And it would have kept you every time you thought about your mom of feeling sad. And, but now you've added to those things of, I think about my mom and I think about some of the things she's taught me and of, of value. Excellent. And that brings then positives and then the behavior comes out of that rather than sitting in sadness and maybe moping or doing nothing or being incapacitated, possibly depending on the intensity. You're inspired, you're motivated, you reach out, you tell your grandchildren about it. And but without the intentional effort to also not throw out the, the sadness of not being here. Excellent. To add in the what are the positives. So that's one very practical thing we can do in missing a person. And what if, Rich, though, I had some unresolved angst mm-hmm. for that person mm-hmm. before they died? How do uh-huh. I deal with that? How do you give, because that's really what will have to happen, a deceased person? It's doable. For sure. And... People are like, but you don't know what they did to me before they died. I'm feeling this grief. I don't understand why I'm feeling this grief because I, I'm so angry with them or I'm so hurt by them or I'm so bitter about this. How, how do I deal with, with that? Mm-hmm. It's the same sort of lists, and you're adding a list. It's not only the sadness from not being here or the, you know, Beth's, oh, what did I learn from it? But what did I not get to do? Or what, not only did I not get to do, what did they not do for me? And, and distinguishing. Or the generation to come. Right. Or the generation to come. The forgiveness and trust are two different things. And, and I can forget Excellent. without the person asking forgiveness. If they ask for forgiveness, we can change the trajectory of the relationship. If I forgive them, I can change the trajectory of my heart. The relationship is still what it is because of whatever they've chosen to do. That it's important to make that list of what did they do that's unresolved? And then how do I practically address that? Well, I have to acknowledge it for what it is, just like we're acknowledging the loss for them not being here, the happiness or the joy or the thankfulness for what they left us. And now also, what did they impart on me or impart on me of damage, right, that I need to validate as well, that maybe while they were here, I didn't validate it in the same way. And now that they're not here, I can own it that I have to address this, make it their responsibility, their failure of me, and then acknowledge that that is something I need to let them off the hook for and be able to move forward in that as well. So it's and remembering way. that forgiveness does not mean uh, that you're saying it was okay. Correct. That is not what forgiveness is. No, you're letting the person off the hook for the poor behavior. And you're not, it is not saying, oh, the behavior doesn't matter. You're actually making it matter as much as it does matter rather than ignoring it, which is trying to say it doesn't matter as much as it does. And let's say the loss is a loss of a friendship. Remember, too, you go back to forgiveness and forgiveness doesn't unnecessarily mean reconciliation. Nope. No, no, no. And, and, and that's maybe, a, that's a maybe we'll know. talk about that one day because, and, and I don't even know if we shouldn't spend just a little bit of time with that because that equals grief. Hi, Kim. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. We're glad you're here. 
Um, and for even those in Facebook land, we appreciate you for being there. And I think Lisa and Jessica were over there the last time and uh, maybe one or two other people, I don't know. I didn't see the names, but this, this is what I've got to say about this. I'm on this kick with relationships related to grieving too, that when you forgive someone, we, we need to help those that are listening and those that will have opportunity on the replay in relationship, whether deceased or whether you're both living now. And that doesn't mean that you have to reconnect. And this is for Christians too, because we, we got this, you know, it's bridge under the water or, or something like that. No, you listen, use wisdom is what I want to say about that. If there has been a uh, disconnect um, or a separation, and I can show, you to it, show it to you scripturally, is God says, go your separate ways. Yeah, forgive and walk in love. Don't speak harm towards them. Continue as God leads you. And they're on your spirit, man, to pray for them and hope for the best for them in all of their endeavors. Forgiveness means I'm going to allow God. I don't need vengeance from it. You owe me nothing. That's what to me forgiveness yeah. means. You owe me nothing. <coughs> I owe, and, and, and no man owe oh any man anything except to love them and i think forgiveness does require that you love the individual love i think you agree the way god loves them the way that god loves them and and listen and 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 that's the only way to love people is the way god loves them honestly you know they're different we're not talking about eros agape right. and all that I, we could do that i, I, I but, actually and i want to say this because i really hear the spirit saying uh, but we're called uh -huh. to be minister of reconciliation. Remember, that scripture is talking about reconciling people to God. Okay? Say, now say we that once again. We want to that... reconcile to one another, but that scripture about being ministers of reconciliation is reconciling mankind to God. There you go. There you okay? go. And, and don't take it out of context. Humankind to God. Yeah, whatever you can, as much as within you lies, the book of Roman tells us, live at to peace. try to, right. Mm -hmm. And live when at like peace. Paul and Silas or Paul and Peter, you have to go to your different corners of the world, do that. That's a loving thing to do. Yeah. That's exactly the loving thing to do because what the world is watching and the opportunity is that we still have that responsibility, as Pamela said, to reconciliation. And if you've reconciled them back to God and do all you can, and every person that you've been in relationship, you can't do that. You, you're not the agent. You're not the one that God has given that space in their lives to be able to do that. You've done the best you could. In, in, uh, one in that matter, one orders, God gives the increase. That, there you go. But please hear us well on this. I think that we're in agreement here. Trying to say, oh, we work through that matter and, and exemplify that and embracing arms to arms. And, and that's not where that, that your heart's not there. Their heart probably isn't there. That's a show. And, and, and God people didn't can discern us. that as well. And their value they, is important. Your being yeah. valued yeah. is more important to God than you're trying to uh, be religious. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm just going to yeah. go there. You know. And, and one of the things I use with my clients, sometimes it's in the context of Christianity, spirituality, relationships, we talk about forgiveness and it brings a certain connotation to it. Right. And if we're in the scriptures and we're supposed to forgive and we get it kind of muddled. Um, right. and I say forgiveness is a financial term right? and, and mm, to look at it rich. right through this lens in particular, and it sheds some light on the other thing. And the quick analogy is if somebody borrows money and doesn't pay it back, right, there's now a debt owed. So on the books, it's showing a debt. Well, as, as the lender, I, I can choose to forgive that debt, which would mean going to their account and making it zero, right? Writing off whatever's there. Writing it off. Yeah, you know, it's writing it off. And, it, and it's nothing to do with anything the other person does. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, that's true. Now, carry that financial example a little bit farther and say, I've forgiven them, but does that mean I'm going to loan them money again? Right? Because their credit score is poor. I mean, so we're not going to entrust them with more of our valuable items or our money, right? right without them rebuilding credit. Excellent. Excellent right? So there's a distinction between forgiveness and trust and who's responsible for what. I mean, and it's trust is not something that is bequeathed. Trust is something that is earned right. through trust worthy behavior right. over a period of time. Right. And how do you then often with the financial thing is to keep giving people some things to think about, right? If, if your credit is poor because you didn't pay a loan back, what do you do to reestablish your credit? Well, a lot of the <laughs> things you do is to initially repay the loan. Right. Right. And then in repaying the loan, Sometimes there's interest associated with it because you didn't pay it back for a period of time. And in financial things, in lending money, there's often interest associated with it. So it benefits both parties. Because if I just loan money for the sake of giving something, that's charity. That's not business. That's not lending money. That is just donating it. And you don't have to pay it back. And if you do, you just give me the same amount back. But in lending, it's an interest and we get an agreement of, I'm going to give you this and you're going to pay me back that much plus this interest. So if we're looking to reestablish our credit, one of the possibilities is to repay the loan back and then also recognize the interest that's accumulated from when you stopped payment until now and working to repay that interest as well. Now, when it comes to interpersonal relationships, that's a different kind of the specific conversation of, of activities to do, but keeping in the financial terms, right? That rebuilds credit and it reestablishes that thing. But that recognize just because you repaid that money back with interest does not mean that lender is going to still offer you money, right? So how so did this conversation get there? We're talking about when you're grieving the loss of a relationship of a person who's still yeah. alive. That's how the conversation got to what we're Yes, saying. and just continuing that process and, and keeping forgiveness and trust separated out because that person, if they're deceased, they're, they're never, if they borrowed money from you and never paid you back, if they're, they're deceased, they can't pay you back. I mean, so you, you can't reconcile that relationship or more so they cannot reconcile the relationship with you because reconciliation at that point is now to me responsibility of the person who Absolutely. failed to pay the money back, not the responsibility of the lender. I mean, I'm not supposed to conjure up a, a credit score for you based on some sort of whimsical idea I have for what it should be, which then would rationalize me to give you money again. That's just silly. Nobody would do that. That's bad business, right? And, and it's not making so again tie, tying it back to our conversation of grief. grief. The question yeah. that came up was, well, how do I if I'm grieving someone who I had angst with before they died, how do I then come to a place of resolution? And, with a, my pra grief? and a practical outflowing of that, then if we're talking about uh, activities to do, sometimes I think writing things down can be very helpful. Yes. Right. To get sure, a view journaling. Of what it is. I think we both yeah. Encourage journal is journal. great and whatever the journaling to me is has any whatever format you want bullet point right. prose right. letters your random thoughts it doesn't really matter it's it's right. whatever tailored for you it's the, your experience that is best and sometimes making a list or describing what is this person borrowed that they didn't pay back right whatever that damage is to look at that and to consciously address each one and say, I'm going to write that to zero. I'm going to write that to zero. I'm going to write that to zero. And whatever the experience is, requires you to do to be able to write that to zero. It's not just, oh, fine, it's zero. That, that's not writing it to zero. That's just flippantly sort of throwing it out there. It's a, it, I just. Yeah, go ahead. Right. right. Have about Rich, I'm minutes. sorry. 
because I want to throw I can talk out about two scriptures. No, I, I mean, I love what you're saying. And apparently they love it over on Facebook. Hi, Toby. How mm -hmm. are you? I, you were on my heart to reach out this week. Uh, she says, rebuilding credit, all kinds of hearts. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Jessica said, authenticity is crucial. Yes, it is. And I've just got where Rich is giving those practical things to get to the practical things. I want you to process from Proverbs 4, 7. And I looked it up because I know what it says. Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But with all their understanding, with all their wisdom, get understanding. And this is a thing that is so important when you're processing the situation of uh, restoration beyond reconciliation. You, you follow where I am here. And before Absolutely. I can say any more, because I'm sorry. I was like, was that in the house? It's outside the house. Okay. I don't know if you hear the sirens or such. But in Romans 12, I looked this up because I want to read it. It says, Pamela's quoted and danced around this. We all have a little bit. <laughs> Um, from 17 of 12 chapters, it recompense to no man evil for evil, providing things honest in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as lies within you, to live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place to anger or wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And then it goes on to talk, therefore, if your enemy is hunger, feed him. Uh, if he's thirsty, give him and drink. And so doing so, you heap the coals of, uh, upon their heads. And we already talked about what that really means. But be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And the reason that I wanted to highlight this, and, and, and you guys push back just a little bit in the next couple of minutes here, and then we're going to close, is, is it's so important that we understand that our releasing, if, 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 if there's an opportunity for vengeance, it's not ours. Vengeance does not belong to us. And avenging yourself detaches God from the matter. Because if I'm going to take the matter into my own hands, and I'm going to say, tying in with grieving, even when you are avenged yourself, and I'm just going to have to be a little transparent here. There's been some opportunities where I said, I'm getting my vengeance, you know, and, and thank you. I'm a quick learner, few and far, because you know, it didn't avail me. It didn't heal me. It didn't make me feel better. I still grieved the matter until I released it to God and allow that God, and I don't even have to see, we, we, to get to the point of true freedom, I don't even have to see God administer his vengeance. I don't even know what that has been or if it's occurred in some of the matters that I've just released him. But if we can get through the process of understanding as we experience grief, as we say, it's not going to be a straight process. You apply this to your grief, you know, this relationship, you know, they're not here anymore, or they're here and they're pretending they didn't do anything to me, that they didn't hurt me, they didn't ruin my life or whatever it is. Um, part of that experience in order to become mentally sound to deal with the grief and to manage it requires that you understand what we're saying about forgiveness and and then the opportunity what is reconciliation and what is restoration I don't know who said that first but that's where I had to get to in my life and I'm going to be honest with it and y'all can push back if you want to but when I start taking on stuff the first thing I remember is reconciliation I didn't articulate it until this morning exactly what I was doing what does he require and, and I was always say oh no man nothing but to love him and people have often questioned me how in the world don't you know they don't like you don't you know they do this and this all I know is he said for me to love them. Now, does that mean I'm up in their face and asking them to dinner and, 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 and inviting them to every part I had? No. And I had to learn that part because I was still pretending that it was okay 
and I was still caught up in grieving and didn't even know what the name of it was. Kim says on, on Zoom with us, me too. It was short lived because conviction came. You know, it's, it's conviction is uh, open yourself up to God. And being honest, like Rich started this thing, I think, Pamela, I know you've got to go for your appointment. We really appreciate you today and Rich as well. But Rich started this stuff about this paper thing, I think. And I think it's a great opportunity. Um, Rich, it's just really a great opportunity. But thank you guys for joining us. Um, I hope I've got the answers over on uh, Facebook Live. Uh, we addressed some of the things that you guys needed to hear. Thank you guys for joining us and Kim here. It's been a great. Uh, Rich, you want to tell us quickly about transformation uh, coming up for April? You know what we're talking about. Uh, that was coming that... up. Yeah, there you go. That, that's how <laughs> prepared I am. But, uh, I'm a fly by well, the seat. Like the, the, first, the first week, and is, I wasn't going to do it. The first week is what is transportation transformation, and when is it necessary? That's what we're going to talk about the first week, uh, and then. Uh, we have someone coming on to give a testimony. Uh, Sandra Strap is joining uh, us. Yeah. Transformation. Um, Excellent. And then the last Excellent. week, hers is around substance abuse. And the last week, either myself or someone that I've invited will talk about uh, transformation, uh, uh, how, um, how we stepped into transformation in spite of mental illness. Wow. Awesome. This is awesome. This is going to be really, really good. So for two of those sessions, yes, as Pamela mentioned, we'll have Sandra Strep joining us. I'm so excited to, to share um, some of the things that she's learned through her process of transformation. Uh, great opportunity for those that think our past has to follow us everywhere we go. Everyone has a past. And so we want to help you as we help one another, I think, is what we learned today, is how important transformation is uh, and living a transformed life that brings God the greatest glory in our lives. Listen, next, year, next month's platform for Take Charge Tuesday is powerful. We have several people that are coming on the platform. Lisa is about to pull that together. I know a couple of people I'm excited about is Lee Gant from uh, Georgia United. We'll take care, Pam. We'll see you later. But Georgia United Credit Union, and listen, if you haven't already opened your account with Georgia United as a GCBM member, please do so. And you'll understand on the second week in April from Lee, some of the opportunities and benefits to doing that. I've got Colette Cosby from The Y. She's going to talk about still continuing elevation, uh, elevation through uh, community involvement. And it's, it's just so many people that are on the platform next month. I'm totally excited. We've got a lot of our community partners joining us. Andy Swan. Uh, it's going to be really, really good. So please make sure you join us this Friday on um, New Nugget. That's what we're going to have somebody. We'll have a guest. We'll announce that probably later tomorrow or early Friday morning. But a great opportunity for you to join in to finish your week well. Thank you guys for joining us. Kim, thank you for your comments. I'm glad she said I needed to hear this. I'm only to love them. That's right. And to be agents of uh, being the strong, that bears the infirmities of the weak, but not necessarily saying, I got to be strong for everybody, making sure that you understand that it's okay for you to share your weaknesses with God. But when it comes to those relationships, that's all it requires. You owe no man nothing but to love them. That's it. That's it. Okay. This has been an outstanding show, huh, Rich? Yeah. Absolutely. You had a good, good, good time month. today. Yeah, yep. good month. Jenny was great for us, wasn't for she? Sure. We really enjoyed her. She for was so sure. awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for joining us over in Facebook land. It's yeah. been wonderful. Enjoy the remainder of your afternoon. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for Jess for being there today as well. God bless you. Enjoy the remainder of your day. We'll see you Friday. Bye-bye now.